The Burial of the Rats, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Haley Flagg. The Burial of the Rats, by Bram Stoker. Leave in Paris by the Orleans Road, cross the Incent, and turn to the right. You find yourself in a somewhat wild and not at all savoury district. Right and left, and before you and behind, and on every side rise great heaps of dust and waste accumulated by the process of time. Paris has its night, as well as its day life, and the sojourner who enters his hotel in the Rue de Rivoli, or the Rue saint Honore late at night, or leaves it early in the morning, can guess, in coming near Montrouge, if he has not done so already, the purpose of those great wagons that look like boilers on wheels, which he finds halting everywhere as he passes. Every city has its peculiar institutions created out of its own needs, and one of the most notable institutions of Paris is its rag-picking population. In the early morning, and Parisian life commences at an early hour, may be seen in most streets standing on the pathway opposite, every court and alley, and between every few houses, as still in some American cities, even in parts of New York, large wooden boxes into which the domestics or tenement holders empty the accumulated dust of the past day. Round these boxes gather and pass on, when the work is done, to fresh fields of labour and pastures new, squalid, hungry-looking men and women, the implements of whose craft consists of a coarse bag or basket slung over the shoulder, and a little rake with which they turn over and probe and examine in the minutest manner the dustbins. They pick up and deposit in their baskets, by aid of their rakes, whatever they may find, with the same facility as a Chinaman uses his chopsticks. Paris is a city of centralization, and centralization and classification are closely allied. In the early times, when centralization is becoming a fact, its forerunner is classification. All things which are similar or analogous become grouped together, and from the grouping of groups rises one whole or central point. We see radiating many long arms with innumerable tentaculae, and in the centre rises a gigantic head with a comprehensive brain and keen eyes to look on every side and ears sensitive to hear, and a voracious mouth to swallow. Other cities resemble all the birds and beasts and fishes whose appetites and digestions are normal. Paris alone is the analogical apothesis of the octopus. Product of centralization carried in an ad absurdum, it fairly represents the devil fish and in no respects is the resemblance more curious than in the similarity of the digestive apparatus. Those intelligent tourists who, having surrendered their individuality into the hands of Messrs. Cook or Gaz, do Paris in three days, are often puzzled to know how it is that the dinner which in London would cost about six shillings can be had for three francs in a café at the Palais Royal. They need have no more wonder if they will but consider the classification, which is a theoretic specialty of Parisian life, and adopt all round the fact from which the chiffoner has his genesis. The Paris of 1850 was not like the Paris of today, and those who see the Paris of Napoleon and Baron Hostman can hardly realise the existence of the state of things 45 years ago. Amongst other things, however, which have not changed are those districts where the waste is gathered. Dust is dust all the world over in every age, and the family likeness of dust heaps is perfect. The traveller, therefore, who visits the environs of Montrouge can go back in fancy without difficulty to the year 1850. In this year I was making a prolonged stay in Paris. I was very much in love with a young lady who, though she returned my passion, so far yielded to the wishes of her parents that she had promised not to see me or to correspond with me for a year. I too had been compelled to accede to these conditions under a vague hope of parental approval. During the term of probation I had promised to remain out of the country and not to write to my dear one until the expiration of the year. Naturally the time went heavily with me. There was not one of my own family or circle who could tell me of Alice, and none of her own folk had, I am sorry to say, sufficient generosity to send me even an occasional word of comfort regarding her health and well-being. I spent six months wandering about Europe, but as I could find no satisfactory distraction in travel, I determined to come to Paris, where, at least, I would be with an easy hail of London in case any good fortune should call me thither before the appointed time. 
that hope deferred maketh the heart sick was never better exemplified than in my case for in addition to the perpetual longing to see the face i loved there was always with me a harrowing anxiety lest some accident should prevent me showing alice in due time that i had throughout the long period of probation been faithful to her trust and my own love thus every adventure which i undertook had a fierce pleasure of its own for it was fraught with possible consequences greater than it would have ordinarily borne like all travellers i exhausted the places of most interest in the first month of my stay and was driven in the second month to look for amusement whithersoever i might having made sundry journeys to the better known suburbs i began to see that there was a terra incognita in so far as the guide-book was concerned in the social wilderness lying between these attractive points accordingly i began to systematize my researches and every day took up the thread of my exploration at the place where i had on the previous day dropped it in the process of time my wanderings led me near montrouge and i saw that hereabouts lay the ultima thule of social exploration a country as little known as that round the source of the white nile and so i determined to investigate philosophically the chiffonier his habitat his life and his means of life the job was an unsavoury one, difficult of accomplishment, and with little hope of adequate reward. However, despite reason, obstinacy prevailed, and I entered into my new investigation with a keener energy than I could have summoned to aid me in any investigation leading to any end, valuable or worthy. One day, late in a fine afternoon, toward the end of September, I entered the Holy of Holies of the City of Dust. The place was evidently the recognised abode of a number of chiffoniers, for some sort of arrangement was manifested in the formation of the dust heaps near the road. I passed among these heaps, which stood like orderly sentries, determined to penetrate further and trace dust to its ultimate location. As I passed along I saw behind the dust heaps a few forms that flitted to and fro, evidently watching with great interest the advent of any stranger to such a place. The district was like a small Switzerland, and as I went forward my torturous course shut out the path behind me. Presently I got into what seemed a small city or community of chiffoniers. There were a number of shanties or huts, such as may be met with in the remote parts of the Bog of Allen. Rude places with wattled walls, plastered with mud and roofs of rude thatch made from stable refuse. Such places as one would not like to enter for any consideration, and which even in watercolour could only look picturesque if judiciously treated. In the midst of these huts was one of the strangest adaptations, I cannot say habitations, I had ever seen. An immense old wardrobe, a colossal remnant of some boudoir of Charles the Seventh or Henry the Second, had been converted into a dwelling house. The double doors lay open, so that the entire menage was open to public view. In the open half of the wardrobe was a common sitting room of some four feet by six, in which sat, smoking their pipes round a charcoal brazier, no fewer than six old soldiers of the First Republic, with their uniforms torn and worn threadbare. Evidently, they were of the mauvais sujet class. Their bleary eyes and limp jaws told plainly of a common love of absinthe, and their eyes had that haggard, worn look of slumber and ferocity which follows hard in the wake of drink. The other side stood as of old, with its shelves intact, save that they were cut to half their depth, and in each shelf of which there were six, was a bed made with rags and straw. The half-dozen of worthies who inhabited this structure looked at me curiously as I passed, and when I looked back after going a little way, I saw their heads together in a whispered conference. I did not like the look of this at all, for the place was very lonely and the men looked very, very villainous. However, I did not see any cause for fear and went on my way, penetrating further and further into the Sahara. The way was torturous to a degree, and from going round in a series of semicircles, as one goes in skating with the Dutch roll, I got rather confused with regard to the points of the compass. When I had penetrated a little way I saw, as I turned the corner of a half-made heap, sitting on a heap of straw, an old soldier with threadbare coat. Hello, said I to myself, the First Republic is well represented here in its soldiery. As I passed him, the old man never even looked up at me, but gazed on the ground with stolid persistency. Again I remarked to myself, See what a life a rude warfare can do. This old man's curiosity is a thing of the past. When I had gone a few steps, however, I looked back suddenly, and saw that curiosity was not dead, for the veteran had raised his head and was regarding me with a very queer expression. 
He seemed to me to look very like one of the six worthies in the press. When he saw me looking he dropped his head, and without thinking further of him, I went on my way, satisfied that there was a strange likeness between these old warriors. Presently I met another soldier in a similar manner. He too did not notice me whilst I was passing. By this time it was getting late in the afternoon, and I began to think of retracing my steps. Accordingly I turned to go back, but could see a number of tracks leading between different mounds, and could not ascertain which of them I should take. In my perplexity I wanted to see someone of whom to ask the way, but could see no one. I determined to go on a few mounds further, and so try to see someone, not a veteran. I gained my object, for after a couple of hundred yards I saw before me a single shanty such as I had seen before, with, however, the difference that this was not one for living in, but merely a roof with three walls open in front. From the evidences which the neighbourhood exhibited, I took it to be a place for sorting. Within it was an old woman, wrinkled and bent with age. I approached her to ask her the way. She rose as I came close, and I asked her my way. She immediately commenced a conversation, and it occurred to me that here in the very centre of the kingdom of dust was a place to gather details of the history of Parisian rag-picking, particularly as I could do so from the lips of one who looked like the oldest inhabitant. I began my inquiries, and the old woman gave me most interest in answers. She had been one of the Setosas who had sat daily before the guillotine and had taken an active part among the women who signalised themselves by their violence in the revolution. While we were talking, she said suddenly, "'But monsieur must be tired standing,' and dusted a rickety old stool for me to sit down. I hardly liked to do so for many reasons, but the poor old woman was so civil that I did not like to run the risk of hurting her by refusing, and moreover the conversation of one who had been at the taking of the Bastille was so interesting that I sat down and so our conversation went on. While we were talking an old man, older and more bent and wrinkled even than the woman, appeared from behind the shanty. "'Here is Pierre,' said she. "'Monsieur can hear stories now if he wishes, for Pierre was in everything, from the Bastille to Waterloo.' The old man took another stool at my request, and we plunged into a sea of revolutionary reminiscences. This old man, albeit clothed like a scarecrow, was like any one of the six veterans. I was now sitting in the centre of the low hut with the woman on my left hand and the man on my right, each of them being somewhat in front of me. The place was full of all sorts of curious objects of lumber, and of many things that I wished far away. In one corner was a heap of rags which seemed to move from the number of vermin it contained and in the other a heap of bones whose odour was something shocking. Every now and then, glancing at the heaps, I could see the gleaming eyes of some of the rats which infested the place. These loathsome objects were bad enough, but what looked even more dreadful was an old butcher's axe, with an iron handle stained with clots of blood, leaning up against the wall on the right-hand side. Still, these things did not give me much concern. The talk of the two old people was so fascinating that I stayed on and on, till the evening came, and the dust heaps threw dark shadows over the veils between them. After a time I began to grow uneasy. I could not tell how or why, but somehow I did not feel satisfied. Uneasiness is an instinct and means warning. The psychic faculties are often the sentries of the intellect, and when they sound alarm the reason begins to act, although perhaps not consciously. This was so with me. I began to bethink me where I was and by what surrounded, and to wonder how I should fare in case I should be attacked, and then the thought suddenly burst upon me, although without any overt cause, that I was in danger. Prudence whispered, Be still and make no sign, and so I was still and made no sign, for I knew that four cunning eyes were on me. Four eyes, if not more. My God, what a horrible thought! The whole shanty might be surrounded on three sides with villains! I might be in the midst of a band of such desperadoes as only half a century of periodic revolution can produce. With a sense of danger my intellect and observation quickened, and I grew more watchful than was my wont. I noticed that the old woman's eyes were constantly wandering toward my hands. I looked at them too, and saw the cause, my rings. On my left little finger I had a large signet, and on the right a good diamond. I thought that if there was any danger my first care was to avert suspicion. Accordingly, I began to work the conversation round to rag-picking, to the drains, of the things found there, and so by easy stages to jewels. Then, seizing a favourable opportunity, I asked the old woman if she knew anything of such things. She answered that she did, a little. 
I held out my right hand, and showing her the diamond, asked her what she thought of that. She answered that her eyes were bad, and stooped over my hand. I said as nonchalantly as I could, "'Pardon me, you'll see better thus,' and taking it off, handed it to her. An unholy light came into her withered old face as she touched it. She stole one glance at me, swift and keen as a flash of lightning. She bent over the ring for a moment, her face quite concealed as though examining it. The old man looked straight out in front of the shanty before him, at the same time fumbling in his pockets and producing a screw of tobacco and a paper and a pipe, which he proceeded to fill. I took advantage of the pause and the momentary rest from the searching eyes on my face to look carefully round the place, now dim and shadowy in the gloaming. There still lay all the heaps of varied reeking foulness, there the terrible blood-stained axe leaning against the wall in the right-hand corner, and everywhere, despite the gloom, the baleful glitter of the eyes of the rats. I could see them even through some of the chinks of the boards at the back, low down close to the ground. But stay, these latter eyes seemed more than usually large and bright and baleful. For an instant my heart stood still, and I felt in that whirling condition of mind in which one feels a sort of spiritual drunkenness and as though the body is only maintained erect, in that there is no time for it to fall before recovery. Then, in another second, I was calm, coldly calm, with all my energies in full vigour, with the self-control which I felt to be perfect, and with all my feeling and instincts alert. Now I knew the full extent of my danger. I was watched and surrounded by desperate people. I could not even guess at how many of them were lying there on the ground behind the shanty, waiting for the moment to strike. I knew that I was big and strong, and they knew it too. They knew also, as I did, that I was an Englishman, and would make a fight for it. And so we waited. I had, I felt, gained an advantage in the last few seconds, for I knew my danger, and understood the situation. Now, I thought, is the test of my courage, the enduring test. The fighting test may come later." The old woman raised her head and said to me in a satisfied kind of way, "'A very fine ring indeed, a beautiful ring. Oh, me, I once had such rings, plenty of them, and bracelets and earrings. Oh, for in those days I led the town a dance. But they've forgotten me now. They've forgotten me. They? Why, they never heard of me. Perhaps their grandfathers remember me, some of them.' And she laughed a harsh, croaking laugh. And then I am bound to say that she astonished me, for she handed me back the ring with a certain suggestion of old-fashioned grace, which was not without its pathos. The old man eyed her with a sort of sudden ferocity, half rising from his stool, and said to me, suddenly and hoarsely, "'Let me see it!' I was about to hand him the ring, when the old woman said, "'No, no, do not give it to Pierre. Pierre is eccentric. He loses things. And such a pretty ring!' "'Cat!' said the old man savagely. Suddenly the old woman said, rather more loudly than was necessary, "'Wait! I shall tell you something about a ring!' There was something in the sound of her voice that jarred upon me. Perhaps it was my hypersensitiveness, wrought up as I was to such a pitch of nervous excitement. But I seemed to think that she was not addressing me. As I stole a glance round the place I saw the eyes of the rats in the bone heaps, but missed the eyes along the back. But even as I looked I saw them again appear. The old woman's wait had given me a respite from attack, and the men had sunk back to their reclining posture. I once lost a ring, a beautiful diamond hoop that had belonged to a queen and which was given to me by a farmer of the Texas, who afterwards cut his throat because I sent him away. I thought it must have been stolen and taxed my people, but I could get no trace. The police came and suggested that it had found its way to the drain. We descended. I in my fine clothes, for I would not trust them with my beautiful ring. I know more of the drain since then, and of rats too. But I shall never forget the horror of that place. Alive with blazing eyes, a wall of them just outside the light of our torches. Well, we got beneath my house. We searched the outlet of the drain, and there, in the filth, found my ring, and we came out. But we found something else also before we came. As we were coming toward the opening, a lot of sewer rats, human ones this time, came towards us. They told the police that one of their number had gone into the drain and had not returned. 
He had gone in only shortly before we had, and, if lost, could hardly be far off. They asked help to seek him, so we turned back. They tried to prevent me going, but I insisted. It was a new excitement, and had I not recovered my ring? Not far did we go, till we came on something. There was but a little water, and the bottom of the drain was raised with brick, rubbish, and much matter of the kind. He had made a fight for it, even when his torch had gone out. But there were too many for him. They had not been long about it. The bones were still warm, but they were picked clean. They had even eaten their own dead ones, and there were bones of rats as well as of the man. They took it cool enough, those others, the human ones, and joked of their comrade when they found him dead, though they would have helped him living. Bah! What matters it, life or death? And you had no fear? I asked her. Fear! she said with a laugh. Me have fear! Ask Pierre. But I was younger then, and as I came through that horrible drain with its wall of greedy eyes, always moving with the circle of the light from the torches, I did not feel easy. I kept on before the men, no. It is a way I have. I never let the men get it before me. All I want is a chance and a means. And they ate him up, took every trace away except the bones, and no one knew it. No one sound of him ever was made. Here she broke into a chuckling fit of the ghastliest merriment which it was ever my lot to hear and see. A great poetess describes her heroine singing, Oh, to see or hear her singing, scarce I know which is divinest. And I can apply the same idea to the old crone, in all save the divinity, for I scarce could tell which was the most hellish, the harsh, malicious, satisfied, cruel laugh, or the leering grin, and the horrible square opening of the mouth like a tragic mask, and the yellow gleam of a few discoloured teeth in the shapeless gums. In that laugh, and with that grin and the chuckling satisfaction, I knew as well as if it had been spoken to me in words of thunder, that my murder was settled, and the murderers only bided the proper time for its accomplishment. I could read between the lines of her gruesome story the commands to her accomplices. Wait, she seemed to say, bide your time, I shall strike the first blow. Find the weapon for me, and I shall make the opportunity. He shall not escape. Keep him quiet, and then no one will be the wiser. There will be no outcry, and the rats will do their work. It was growing darker and darker. The night was coming. I stole a glance round the shanty. Still all the same. The bloody axe in the corner, the heaps of filth, and the eyes on the bone heaps and in the crannies of the floor. Pierre had been still ostensibly filling his pipe. He now struck a light and began to puff away at it. The old woman said, "'Dear heart, how dark it is! Pierre, like a good lad, light the lamp!' Pierre got up, and with the lighted match in his hand touched the wick of a lamp which hung at one side of the entrance to the shanty, and which had a reflector that threw the light all over the place. It was evidently that which was used for their sorting at night. "'Not that stupid! Not that! The lantern!' she called out to him. He immediately blew it out, saying, "'All right, mother, I'll find it,' and he hustled about the left corner of the room. The old woman saying through the darkness, "'The lantern! The lantern! Oh, that is the light that is most useful to us poor folks. The lantern was the friend of the revolution. It is the friend of the chiffonier. It helps us when all else fails.' Hardly had she said the word when there was a kind of creaking of the whole place, and something was steadily dragged over the roof. Again I seemed to read between the lines of her words. I knew the lesson of the lantern. "'One of you get on the roof with a noose.' and strangle him as he passes out if we file within. As I looked out of the opening, I saw a loop of rope outlined black against the lurid sky. I was now, indeed, beset. Pierre was not long in finding the lantern. I kept my eyes fixed through the darkness on the old woman. Pierre struck his light. By its flash, I saw the old woman raise from the ground beside her, where it had mysteriously appeared, and then hide in the folds of her gown a long, sharp knife or dagger. It seemed to be like a butcher's sharpening iron fine to a keen point. The lantern was lit. "'Bring it here, Pierre,' she said. "'Place it in the doorway where we can see it. See how nice it is. It shuts out the darkness from us. It is just right.' "'Just right for her, and her purposes. It threw all its light on my face, leaving in gloom the faces of both Pierre and the woman, who sat outside of me on each side. I felt that the time of action was approaching, but I knew now that the first signal and movement would come from the woman, and so watched her. I was all unarmed, but I had made up my mind what to do, 
at the first movement i would seize the butcher's axe in the right hand corner and fight my way out at least i would die hard i stole a glance round to fix its exact locality so i could not fail to seize it at the first effort for then if ever time and accuracy would be precious good god it was gone all the horror of the situation burst upon me but the bitterest thought of all was that if the issue of the terrible position should be against me alice would infallibly suffer either she would believe me false and any lover or any one who has ever been one can imagine the bitterness of the thought or else she would go on loving long after i had been lost to her and to the world so that her life would be broken and embittered shattered with disappointment and despair the very magnitude of the pain braced me up and nerved me to bear the dread scrutiny of the plotters i think i did not betray myself the old woman was watching me as a cat does a mouse and had her right hand hidden in the folds of her gown clutching i knew that long cruel-looking dagger had she seen any disappointment in my face she would i felt have known that the moment had come and would have sprung on me like a tigress certain of taking me unprepared i looked out into the night and there i saw a new cause for danger before and around the hut were at a little distance some shadowy forms and they were quite still but i knew that they were all alert and on guard small chance for me now in that direction again i stole a glance round the place in moments of great excitement and of great danger which is excitement the mind works very quickly and the keenness of the faculties which depend on the mind grow in proportion i now felt this in an instant i took in the whole situation i saw that the axe had been taken through a small hole made in one of the rotten boards how rotten they must be to allow of such a thing being done without a particle of noise the hut was a regular murder trap and was guarded all round a garroter lay on the roof ready to entangle me with his noose if i should escape the dagger of the old hag in front the way was guarded by i know not how many watchers and at the back was a row of desperate men i had seen their eyes still through the crack in the boards of the floor when last i looked as i lay prone waiting for the signal to start erect if it was to be ever now for it end of the burial of the rats part one recording by haley flag of texas